Welcome everyone. Oh my goodness, it's 12.01. Um, so let's see, we have, if you could put in the chat um, where you're from. I know so far we have some folks from Minnesota, California, um, St. Louis, Missouri, India, uh, VED, um, it's 8.30 there, so it, it'd almost be my bedtime. Uh, the UK, wonderful. Uh, so uh, welcome. Um, oh, 9.30, 9.30, Central New York. So uh, I think we have a really good uh, variety here. And Jervis, we're so happy that you came and are willing uh, to talk to us today. Uh, I uh, we just appreciate it so much. And I have my book here. Excellent. <laughs> and so if I could just uh, say a few things about Jervis, I first met Jervis at um, a Hawaii conference, a Hawaii ISODC conference. Oh, yeah. And I was so nervous to meet Jervis. And uh, how's that for a rhyme? And uh, um, because he is an amazing scholar, uh, scholar practitioner. I love that his work is, you know, it's very scholarly, but yet it can be applied right to our everyday lives, uh, which is so important. Uh, Jervis got his initial training at the Sir George Williams Center for Human Relations and Community Studies in Montreal. He then completed his PhD in organization behavior at Case Western Reserve, and he's published over 100 articles, chapters, and books on leadership, organization development, teamwork, and change. His book, Clear Leadership, has been translated into eight languages, and his Clear Leadership course is licensed for delivery all over the world. Uh, Jervis is a professor of leadership and org development at the BD School of Business, and at Saint or Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. So That's welcome. True. Well, it's true. Thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm really happy to be invited. Thanks. We have a lot of people coming in. So okay. Um, just to let all of you know, I have not prepared a presentation. Uh, I plan this to be much more of an informal conversation. I'm going to invite you to talk to me and I'm going to talk back. And uh, so uh, and I, I, I guess Kimberly is going to start off. We're going to start on a conversation about and I have a, a wide range of interests and in work. But yeah. the two mm -hmm. dominant themes in my career have been one, how do we create more collaborative forms of organizing, uh, both at a macro level and at a micro level? And the other one has been around transformational change processes. Um, how do we how do we help organizations move quickly to shift what they're doing and how they're doing it? So, can I share something real quick? Sure. So I it's sort of a question, but um, I was at the gym yesterday and uh, somebody made a suggestion to the lifeguard, and the lifeguard kind of laughed and he said, "That's a really good suggestion, but I don't give suggestions anymore because leadership gets really defensive." every time we give a suggestion. And I was like, oh my gosh, leadership. But I think a lot of leadership does get defensive when their employees are bringing uh, forth new ideas and so, you know, whether it's big or small, how can we get leaders to not be that way? Wow, well, it's <laughs> funny as I hear that, it reminds me of my own life, like, and how I got into this field. It was my first job in Montreal was as a bus boy at a, four star restaurant in a big hotel there. And the first week I had three great ideas for how to improve the efficiency of, you know, stuff moving in and out of the kitchen. And I went to my supervisor and I said, Hey, I've got some ideas. And she said, shut up and get back to work. And I thought, <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, this is work. This is what work is like. Yeah. yeah. It's the people, people spend their life doing that, you know, and like, this is terrible. And I was Probably part of how I got into this field, um, you know, um, and it's uh, it's sad to me to hear a story like that because yeah. what a, what a waste of human capital, right? And how crushing it is. I think most of us who get into this field, and I'm going to assume that virtually everybody in this call identifies with the field of organization development, um, and I think that's one of the things that attracts us. I, I call it our tribe, whether you call yourself OD or not. Yeah, you 
you have this desire to create great organizations and great teams and you know that that's about people feeling like they can bring the best of themselves to, to their situation and, and you know have an impact and make a difference and and uh so uh, but you know obviously there are places where <laughs> leaders don't feel that way um and i you know fortunately because of my position, which is I don't work internally as an OD consultant, although I have a few times, so I know what that world is like. Mm -hmm. I don't have to convince anybody that I work with that this is a good idea. They, right. you know, they seek me out because they're already convinced this is a good idea. Right. So that's that's a privilege. Um, and I, I, the only the only change process I've ever found that actually works at changing other people, and in the clear leadership course we say this, you know, like. It's hard to change other people. We all know this, right? right. It's also hard to change myself. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I can change my pattern of interaction with you in a second. And that that is really the, the, the core of any sort of organizational change is the experience that the way I interact with you has now changed in some way, fundamentally. And, uh, and I can make those choices to show up differently. And one of the ways I can choose to show up differently is to, is to develop an appreciative mindset. Mm -hmm. And this is something I kind of taught myself in the early 90s um, was this idea that whatever I want more of already exists in the other person. And, and the only way to get more of it is to pay attention to that and notice it. And, and I found that this can work on bosses <laughs> because, uh, you know, like in the case of I want a boss who, you know, is, is more, um, is, has greater interest in hearing what other people have to say and greater interest in sourcing ideas and trying new things. And so just noticing when they do that and then saying something appreciative about it, um, it's the only way I know that actually successfully can lead other people to start acting differently. Yeah. Okay. And it's based on the assumption that we co-construct each other in our interactions, which is fundamental to the sort of the whole dialogic OD enterprise is this mm -hmm. belief that we're in relationship and that how we show up depends on the nature of the relationships we're in. And I could spend an hour just talking about that idea and sort of this appreciative approach to things. And um, some people, you know, Bob, uh, Bob Pippen and I wrote an article on this in 1991 called Appreciative Process, mm -hmm. a transformational change approach. And and uh, we called it tracking and fanning. Like, what do you want more of? Then start looking for it, assuming that it's already there. And then when you find it, find some way to give it some air and, and amplify it. You know, now people call it um, uh, positive deviance. You know, mm -hmm. similar, similar kind of theory. And um, at the time in my own consulting practice, I noticed that I had been trained to go into any group and tell you what was dysfunctional about it. And I could do that you know, within about five minutes. And, and I thought that that was my job okay, as an OD consultant was to go and collect data and present the data against some ideal or something. And here's the gap and, and somehow showing people the gap would motivate them and they'd want to now change. And um, that isn't what happened, you know? I go in and show people the gap and then they'd fill the gap and then they'd be unhappy and then they wouldn't want me around. And uh, when I started shifting that and paying attention, well, what do I like about what's going on here? What's working? You know, where is there you know, whatever it is? And, and, and even starting with my client, like, what do you want more of? Well, let's look for where it's already happening. And that has such a different impact on my clients to begin with, they liked having me around. I go in and say, here's what's good about what you guys are doing. And here's what's really working. And how do we get more of that? And, um, and I would say it took about 10 years to really supplant what had been primarily a deficit mindset of paying attention to what I don't like and what's not working. Where's the gap and all that. It's just a sort of basic way of operating where kind of assume the best uh, believe that people want, I call it the normal human virtues. We all want to be liked. We all want to be in great teams. We all want to make a contribution. We all want to be seen as competent. We all want to make the world better for our children. I mean, it's just, it's, you just assume that that is in, in this case, the lifeguard's boss. There's a part of them, you know, that wants to be a great boss, that wants to enliven people, that wants to do the best job they know how, so on and so forth. 
I mean, they send customer I... surveys out all the time. So, yeah. you know, I'm thinking they really do want to make things better. <laughs> Maybe they just don't want to hear from the front lines. I don't know. But those are the people that see everything, right? The boots well, on the ground. Maybe, you know, I have a story that goes like this. Everybody, when the first time they become a supervisor, they say, I'm not going to be like those jerks I worked for before. I'm going to be a participative leader. I'm going to invite people to participate. And so what they do is before they make any decision, they invite people to participate. And what they discover is everybody has a different idea. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and they can't get anybody to agree on anything. And after a while, people become frustrated with them. And they'll say, well, you just make a decision. And they do. And then everybody gets upset with them. Yeah, you made a decision. with them. And then they go, okay, enough of this participative thing. I'm going to try something different. Um, and, you know, I, so I don't think it's a motivation problem. I think it's a skill problem. Okay. You know, uh, people don't know how to be a participative leader effectively. And I, I think that's what we teach in clear leadership is kind of the, the fundamentals of what's required for that to happen. And those are also the fundamentals for generative leadership, which is the, the label we're using now to talk about this a kind of leadership that, you know, doesn't know the answer and invites those who are going to have to change into those conversations and 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 creating the changes they want to create. So when is your when is your next um, leadership course cohort? Uh, for clear leadership? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm doing them right now inside companies. I'm not doing a public oh, okay. first day. Other okay. people are, mm -hmm. um, and there some of those are online. Okay. So if you go to clearleadership.com and go to the course, you know the public courses that are available are listed there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. I just came back from uh, a month in Morocco, where we ran the first clear leadership course in Africa, wow. which was very exciting. And Morocco is an amazing place. I had no idea. Uh, I just uh, was so impressed with what's going on there and with the people I met and um, just what's going on in the country. And uh, and that was a lot of fun. And 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 it was it delivered. It's, it's part of this developing an internal dialogic OD group in one of the biggest companies there. It's called OCP. They're a fertilizer company. Mm -hmm. um, and with the idea that they're going and they're going to sort of spread this out other businesses because OCP is is a crown corporation literally and, and figuratively yeah, right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and and so they have a social development mission as well as making tons of money uh, and uh and spreading the largesse and so the CEO of OCP has a vision of transforming Africa uh, uh through the work they do so and 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 clear leadership just went over exceedingly well with the first cohort that went through and we're training up people there to deliver it from this point on and they'll be doing it in French because French is the dominant professional language there which I don't okay. very well uh so anyway um so Oada yeah. who I which I think is Nancy Coldham um she says how does culture impact the ability to shift to generative leadership well totally so that's when we when I first started running clear leadership courses in companies about 20 years ago, we did a bunch of research on transfer of the skills we were teaching people into work. And what we discovered was a blinding flash of the obvious, which is that every organization has a leadership culture. And if you're going to ask people to show up differently at work, you're going to have to shift the culture at the same time as you're giving them new skills and competencies and ways of thinking about things. And the number one thing that predicted whether people were utilizing this new way of being a leader at work was whether or not their boss was. <laughs> Which was what? What about their boss? Like, like I had to do research to figure that out. Like, <laughs> you know. Could you say that again, Jervis? The number one predictor of whether people would use new skills and abilities at work was whether or not their boss was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right? So, and so what we found is the places where clear leadership has had the most impact on a company is when it starts at the very top and the executive team goes through it and they make a commitment to showing up differently with each other and then we waterfall it down. And partly 
that's how you, and we wrote, there's a chapter on this if anybody's interested at a, and a, I can put it in the chat describing this process. It was at Palomar Health, which is a big healthcare operation in San Diego. And they went two years, they went from 61st percentile to 91st percentile in employee, uh, play, play partnership, play engagement on uh, Prescani scores. So they, it had a big shift in the culture. And, um, and big reason, like we know, is that the leadership really sets the tone for the culture. And we know that. But also, they had an internal OD group. And so as people were going through the training, they were also utilizing the skill set and point of view in large group activities they were doing, strategic planning meetings, you know, facilitating interdepartmental or intergroup kinds of things. So they were building it into the culture. And um, and it, it really happened. Um, so And I think Prescani is a hundred percent patient scores, right? Uh, okay. Prescani measures sure. they're like they're, they, well, they do a lot of different measurements for oh, okay. healthcare, okay. but one of them they do is employee engagement or oh. employee participation. They call it partnership. Okay. Employees feel they're in partnership with the organization. Um, and that, and that, and clear leadership. So what we do in that course is we define what, what creates, what is a collaborative organization? What does it mean to be collaborative? And we define it as a relationship in which everyone feels responsible for the success of their common purpose, okay? So, so that collaborative organizing depends on micro relations of partnership. Okay? And we focus on, and, and, and that, that relationship, how do we create a relationship with you where we both feel responsible for the success of our common purpose has been kind of my dependent variable for a long time and trying to understand how does a leader create that kind of relationship with the people who work for him or her? Because the natural move is to make the boss responsible, right? And there's a bunch of things, you know, Barry Oshie in particular has been like brilliant at identifying the sort of patterns that normally destroy that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but he doesn't have a lot of solutions around how to fix that. I think we do. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, the, the primary thing it comes down to is the leader's willingness to let other people have their own experience and not feel it's their job to make sure that people are having the right experience. May uh, I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so I, for the past three and a half years, have been working on all the things you're talking about um, at Medtronic with a um, organizational development team. And, you know, Medtronic's gone through some major transformations that we, we had a new CEO in the middle of COVID and he implemented a new um, operating model, all those things. And we had a new culture. And what I find is the actually the biggest hurdle I think we were facing is a lot of managers and middle managers and maybe middle executives were adopting the things we were asking them to, but the executive committee and the CEO were not modeling those things as well. How, how do you like adjust that, manage that dynamic? I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know. no, I, I, I don't have a lot of wisdom on how to convince people to be different who don't think they should be. I think part of the problem, like Medtronic's a publicly traded company, right? Yes. I, I, I've given up on publicly traded companies, frankly, because, you know, they're just so driven by quarterly earnings and yeah. by needing to meet the needs of, you know, Wall Street. And, and, and so much gets driven by that. And, you know, some of it's gamesmanship, like they're, 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 you know, they're gaming the numbers so that they look good. And, you know, to the executives, a lot of the incentive is to move stock price and, you know, it's not about people and it's not about creating a great organization. It's not about long term. It's about quarterly meeting your numbers, right? Yeah, we felt that. And who can blame them? That's yeah. that's the structure of the situation they're in. So mm -hmm. I, you know, um, and, you know, the best way to juice your numbers is reduce your expenses. And the best way to reduce your expenses is to get rid of a bunch of people. Which they <laughs> just <They're> did. All <laughs> All the evidence in the world is when you lay off a bunch of people, you end up rehiring them in about two years and your exactly. results actually go down. It doesn't matter because the immediate hit 
boom, is like your quarterly profits go up, your stock price goes up, everything looks great. Um, how can you argue against that? It takes a tremendous amount of courage on the part of a, a CEO of a publicly traded company to push against the sort of quarterly earnings um, requirements and and do something different. So. I think I think Ashley, somebody they have to have somebody who's willing to speak truth to them. Yeah. You know, uh, without I mean, I've heard so many stories when people are, you know, they've gotten that new job and they're on their way out the door. Then that's when they have the nerve to speak truth to power, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, they really have to somehow, um, you know, be able to get that information in a way that the people don't feel, yeah. either the CEO doesn't feel threatened or the people giving it don't feel threatened. Yeah, Jacqueline put in, in the chat, I think you, the the biggest point that they're missing is that better, you know, better environment for your people and, and all of that and collaborative environment, it will actually increase the dollars. But to your point, Gervais, like it it, it is totally a quarterly game, so. Yeah, well, I mean, it is just they don't know. Mm -hmm. I think they know. Mm -hmm. You know, the speak truth, the power thing, it's like, they know. They they know what they're doing is crushing human capital or whatever. It's not, they're not stupid. Um, but it's just not what they're getting rewarded for. Yeah. Right? And, and it's about the long-term versus the short-term, right? Which is like a company like OCP in Morocco, which is a crown corporation, the same CEO has been in the, there for you know 15 years or so it has this vision you know it's way beyond this company and yeah. like and he can do that because he you know he's he's got the king of morocco on his side <laughs> can i make a comment sorry what was that jonathan this is jonathan um i think one of the in light of all of the uh layoffs that uh have occurred and continue to occur recently is something that's underreported. And that is that uh, in many cases, <clears throat> almost as many people that were laid off are rehired, yeah. but they're rehired in new skill sets and new jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and that raises the, the kind of human capital philosophy of, well, you know, how, how do we acquire new new talent? We can hire it from the outside. We can develop it from uh, within, um, or we can get contractors, consultants, right? But it it just seems like this this churn. So we 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 lay off a whole bunch of people, but we're going to hire new people that are more in line with our strategic direction of the company, who with skill sets that our current workforce doesn't have. Yeah. Yeah. You can't argue with the logic of that if you're looking at it from a purely from a performance point of view. It, yeah. Uh, right. Um, but if you're looking at it from a longer term game about wanting to create a great organization, probably, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that's not such a great idea because you know, you're not creating any loyalty. Right. And the people still get PTSD, right? Because they've been let go. I mean, that's one thing I love about Japanese management and lean thinking is mm -hmm. that, you know, they say at the beginning of this process, no one's going to lose their job. You might have a different job. You might have a new job, <laughs> uh, not one you anticipated, but you will have a job. And uh, I think that that uh, when you can say that at the beginning of a change process, mm -hmm. I think everybody ex exhales. Yeah, right? you get a lot more great ideas. And I, yeah. I remember at one point, Steelcase, which is, you know, an excellent company. Mm -hmm said to its employees, listen, and this is during the process engineering revolution. So people are just starting to use sort of process engineering thinking to look at ways to how do we get rid of work that's meaningless? And, and, and they said to all their employees, look, we know there's a lot of work that's going on right now that we don't need to be doing. So if you can demonstrate to us how you can eliminate your job, we'll give you 20% of the savings and we'll guarantee you a new job. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> the next year, there was a profound transformation in that organization. This whole department's got, you know, got rid of themselves. You don't need us anymore. And like, yeah, you know. So I mean, I think that short-term strategy, though, of laying people off and then hiring new people that have the skills, 
there is yeah. a really bigger um, transformation take taking place, and and that's the uh, the the uh, proliferation of the fourth industrial revolution technologies, yeah. and um, there. The fundamental question is, you know, you 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 can't lay off all all these people and and hope to find people in the market that have those new skills related to the related to four IR. Maybe some, mm -hmm. but you've got to make a decision. You know, don't we need to reskill, upskill our, our employees for this new four IR transformation that's occurring? I mean, what's that strategy like? Okay. I agree with you. So that has a I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about the longer term impact of, mm -hmm. you know, oh, that's interesting. Who what shared that? Followers, leaders, and purpose. Courageous followership. Who shared that? <laughs> oh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, you shared that. Do I say something about that, Jacqueline? You're muted. Apparently not. <laughs> I love her disruption. She just took I know. the screen. <laughs> it's like, take that. <laughs> I like purpose being that purpose has become the center of my work as well. Mm, wow, um, interesting. And especially around generative leadership and generative change, I make this distinction between vision and purpose. And um, I think it's a really, really important distinction, which uh, whenever I talk to leaders about it, they get it. And uh, right now, people use the same word sort of interchangeably. And mm -hmm. to me, a vision is a clear image of an endpoint, a target, a goal, what it's going to be like when we get there, whereas a purpose is what we're trying to do every day. And oh, Jacqueline keeps coming in and out. I think she might be having technical difficulties. <laughs> oh. right. You know, Jack, uh, one of the uh, things you read about uh, and how uh, organizational leaders can respond to the great resignation mm -hmm. and the dissatisfaction that people have uh, with prevailing management practices. Well, what what are what are strategies to improve retention, engagement, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. And it's interesting because one of the themes that's coming out is stop focusing so much on vision, mission, and focus on purpose. Unite mm -hmm. people around purpose. Yeah. And, and you see that in, in more and more in in, in the literature, yeah. right? And you know, a lot of that literature is talking about like inspiring purpose. Yeah. Um, I don't know that that's so important. What I, what I think is important about purpose is, is there's a lot of different ways to accomplish a purpose. Okay. Right. And so when we focus on purpose and we say to people, here's our purpose. So let's say our purpose is to delight our customers. Like a vision it, to delight our customers might be, you know, 100% on time delivery. And so we're going to drive everybody and all our processes to create 100% on time delivery. And what that ends up happening is the people who are actually dealing with customers, you know, they got customers who don't care about 100% of time delivery. They care about something different, right? And it could even be that, that what you're doing to drive that vision gets in the way of those people being able to delight those customers, right? But if you start with purpose and you say, our purpose is to delight customers, you figure it out. Like, you know, then you get this opportunity to try all these different things and innovations and people have an opportunity to do stuff they know is going to delight their specific customer in that specific place. So it, it opens up this possibility, a, a range of possibilities. That it's a far more generative approach to leadership to, to lead with purpose than to lead with vision. You know, you pick up anything on leadership these days, it's vision, 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 vision. And part of the problem is that leaders expect, uh, people expect their leaders to have a vision. And, and if the leader says, well, you know, I have a purpose. I'm not sure how you can accomplish it, and I want you to do what you need to do to accomplish it. Some people think that that's a lack of leadership. Mm. They go to the leader and say, should we do this or that? And the leader says, well, you figure it out. Go, Why are you the leader? You know? Right. <laughs> but Michelle, sure Michelle has a great question. How does the hybrid remote uh, world impact the collaborative organization? Uh, well, I think we all know it. It, it gets, it's not great. And it's like, um, 
I run a, a simulation course in our in our MBA program. I've been running it for 20 years. And we used to do it out and we first designed it for industry. And it's a three-day simulation. And we create we create different departments of the same organization and they're in different parts of the building and they have to buy an airplane pass to see each other. And they always start out trying to organize remotely. Mm-hmm. In the past, this was, you know, telephone calls, Skype, something like that, you know, and it never works. <laughs> They have to get on a plane and go visit each other initially. And the way I, I've come to understand this is you can't develop a common map of the situation remotely and you can't build a team until you have a common map of the situation. Yeah. Once you have a common map of the situation, then you can you can coordinate remotely. But you got to get everybody in the same room initially to get a common headspace about what's what here. Um, and so I think trying to trying to manage remotely without those times when we come, whenever we got to enter into something new, do something differently, we need to get together to get that common headspace. That's one problem. Yeah. I right? Second agree. problem is that effective teamwork, re- re- you know, requires trust. It requires fundamentally it requires trust. And I don't think we can develop trust that well remotely. We can do it a little bit, but there's something about being in the same room. And see, and looking at each other in the eye, and all that interaction that happens between the moments of, you know, task mm-hmm. that uh, they get lost, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to pick that up uh, remotely. So I think it's undoubted, but like there's a bunch of stuff where we don't have to get together, and why would we, you know? And it's great not having to drive to work, and you know, I, I have my own home office here, I love it, mm-hmm. but. Um, but working that way exclusively, I don't think, I don't right. think it's going to work either. Right. But, Ved has a question. He says individuals do not change fundamentally uh, in who they are without some kind of serious personal crisis of some kind. And revitalizing people has a lot less to do with changing people and has more to do with changing the context of the companies. How can you change the context? That's interesting. That's an interesting point of view. Well, you know, generally contextual changes come from a shift in leadership. Mm-hmm. Right? So either the leaders change, like like the people who are in leadership change, or the leaders go through some personal transformation of some sort. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that people have to go through tragedy to change is a it's a powerful notion and, and there's a lot of truth to it, but it's not the only way. Yeah. Right. And um, like in, in our research on transformational change, one of the things that keeps showing up is a generative image. And a generative image is a combination of words that allows people to see the situation in ways they never saw it before. So that is a fundamental change of context, but it's, it's a narrative change of context. Um, and um, give you some examples. So, um, what? It, so, there's this bank in 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 Asia that ten years ago was at the bottom of the league tables. It was it was a terrible bank. It wasn't doing very well. It um, it uh, consistently rated terrible customer service in in Singapore. It, its name DBS was. Uh, utilized as a kind of an adjective for terrible <laughs> service and the ceo decided they wanted to change that from an organization that was really fundamentally process and control oriented one that was really customer facing and, and really focused on so they needed to create a new context right and the image they came up with was make banking joyful now make banking joyful so <laughs> and today dbs is at the top you know, considered the best customer service and and like highly successful bank. And you think about when that first shows up, what the heck does it mean? In fact, even to this day, the CEO kind of chuckles to himself when he uses it, you know. I don't know, so he's going like, don't take me too seriously, but you know, what does it mean to make banking joyful? Now, you take a generative image like that and you invite people to the conversation. Right. whether they're customers, their employees, people who sell mortgages, frontline tellers, and you ask them the question, what, what can we do here to make banking joyful? People will have answers to that question. And then in a generative change approach, what you want to do is, is engage people in those conversations and then tell them, go do it. 
go do it tomorrow. Don't wait for a plan. Don't wait for permission. Whatever you know you can do tomorrow to make banking more joyful, go do it. Okay. That's trans. And when we when we find any case of truly transformational change in an organization, almost always there's a generative image that either they began with or that emerged at some point that created a whole different op different set of opportunities for a conversation that wasn't taking place before. And generative images have four properties. One, and most importantly, is they're appealing. And there's something about it that as a stakeholder, as a person who's going to have to change to make the change happen, I find that I, I like it. I want to make banking joyful. I would like to go to work at a bank that was joyful on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it's appealing. One. Two, however, it's not clear at all what it means. <laughs> it's not clear what the solution to that is. Mm -hmm. right? So it's ambiguous. And it's the ambiguity of a generative image that retains its generative capacity. Over time, it keeps throwing off new ideas. So what does it mean to make banking joyful? So as we talk about that, we new ideas emerge. And, you know, and um, and three, it's surprising. Like in this con and usually a generative image is only generative in a specific context. So in this context, the whole idea of joyful banking was what the hell is that? You know, it's surprising. Um, and people want to act on it. And uh I'm forgetting what the fourth quality is right now, but it's somewhere in there. <laughs> um, and I've got a whole list of these uh, generative images. And now my work as a consultant, when I'm working with uh, somebody who wants to create transformational change, once we identify sort of what the big hairy problem is, then my first move is, how do we reframe that into a generative image that's going to attract the people who need to change into conversations about creating that change that they want to act on and that yeah, you know, that's the thing about generative conversations is that those are conversations that produce new ideas that the people who are producing those ideas actually want to act on and they will go act on that and just leave them alone they'll go act on them. that's and that's what really speeds up the transformation process not you know like one of the things like when i was in morocco i did this um about 70 people showed up for a, a one-day workshop on Dialogic OD and generative change, and from all these different companies and organizations, and they all agreed. Everybody is dissatisfied with the change management approach to change. They all know it doesn't work. You know, create a task force, bring in a bunch of experts, come up with a bunch of recommendations, try to shove it down people's throats. Everybody knows it doesn't work, and they're all looking for a different way to do things. And that's what the generative change model is offering them. And people are getting excited about it because it's like, and it won't work in every situation. You know, it'll only work in situations where you can try a bunch of different things at the same time and learn as you go, because that's the fundamental sort of strategy here. You know, you got a complex situation. You don't know how to, you don't know what the right answer is. Try a bunch of different things and learn as you go right. and engage the people who are going to have to change in coming up with those things and then watching closely as they're doing stuff and seeing what works and tracking and planning that. Um, and I think the evidence is really clear at this point that you get a lot more change, a lot more quickly going in that direction than trying to, which using more high engagement strategies, which most dialogic OD processes do, which you bring people together, get them to generate a bunch of ideas and then hand that off to the leadership and they're supposed to do something with it. And then you're back to a kind of a you know, implementation problem again. Um, so anyway, generative images. I they really love powerful. that. Yeah. Very powerful. Not always easy to come up with. There's a lot more art than science to that one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like take what's going on in diversity, equity, and inclusion right now. Mm -hmm. It's like the big question to me, if I was working in that space, would be, how do I get the people who would normally be the last people to come to that conversation who want to come to that conversation? Okay. So we say, we're going to have a conversation about diversity and inclusion. There's the usual suspects who are going to, you know, immediately want to come to that conversation. They're not the ones we need to get to. You know, we need to get to the ones that see this as an attack or, uh, you know, like for whatever reason. Like, so what's going to bring them to that conversation? Right? And that's the generative image that's going to really make a difference. So if you go back in Italy, there's one story out of the appreciative inquiry literature where they transformed Avon of Mexico from a company where women had no influence, no power to a company where 
the Catalyst Foundation said that they were the best place for women to work at in Mexico. And what was their generative image? Anybody know the story? I don't. Uh, was, what's the nature of an exceptional intergender working relationship? Oh. What is an exceptional intergender working relationship? No one had ever asked that question. I think it's still not a question that's asked very often, right? The question that gets asked is what's harassment and how do you stop it? And, and what, what the consultants were finding was that the more they asked that question, the more harassment there was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they said, they, so they went into Avon in Mexico and they said, we, you know, any, we, we'd like couples who believe they have an exceptional intergender working relationship to come forward. We're gonna interview them hoping they would get 25 maybe. Well, they got 125 and they they called their stories and, you know, folded those stories back in in an appreciative sort of inquiry sort of way and led to a whole series of shifts and policies and procedures in the company and, um, and a real transformation. Uh, yeah, Jim. I guess yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would like you to. I would like to take you back to the uh, DEI thing and 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 say again what your position is because you said how do I get to the people that need it or what was you, what was your position? Again? Oh, who would be the least likely to come to that conversation in the first place? Okay, because yeah. doesn't it uh, involve? I wanna, yeah, like as a generative change agent, I want to open a space where people who are gonna to have to change are gonna to come to conversations about how to make that change happen. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, we just published a book. I hope all of you are familiar with the BMI series in Dialogic OD. So I've been editing and publishing a series of books. There are a hundred pages, very practically focused, one theory of, of practice and, and how to do it. And our last book is on creating inclusive cultures by uh, Fred Miller and Judith Katz and Monica Biggs, who know a lot about how to do this. And um, and their focus is on in inclusion. They don't go after diversity or equity, they go after inclusion. How do we create an inclusive culture? Because that appeals to everyone. Right. right? And creating a space where everybody can show up and be themselves, and there's tolerance for the diversity of all kinds of diversities, right? We're not, we don't even pick that from the beginning. Um, and I think it's in the notion of inclusion that there's opportunities to create a space where, you know, uh, people who would hear DEI as, you know, a looming attack on them and want to run away from it might be much more likely to, to engage in that conversation. Yeah, Jonathan. Jervis, are you familiar that uh, the... Uh, idea behind DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is now um, including a fourth element, which is uh, B for belonging. Yeah. Oh, I heard that. that diversity, equity, and inclusion are sufficient, are, are, are important, but insufficient alone to create a sense of belonging, which is a, uh, a cultural quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's opening up some very interesting. Um, uh, uh conversations and leading um you know to think about dei in in, in a, a broader cultural uh, context which i think is uh uh being widely widely accepted i mean nobody's pushing back on adding the b to dei right, right. diana would you say something about what you guys are doing yeah or sure i'm happy to hi um yeah, so um, we're, we're partnering with an outside um, vendor, but when we started looking at the need to really build out something that addresses the the inequities, um, we we decided rather than you know kind of bandying about the DEI banner that we really wanted to lean in on the belonging and inclusion um, concepts, just to you know to help people not to feel we didn't want people to get their hackles up the minute that we were bringing this, this topic forward. Mm -hmm. And so we found that, you know, by, I mean, we're just in the beginning phases of it. We're just starting to put the plan together, but it's, it's all about infusing this into 
already existing meetings that are happening across the organization rather than creating this new you know, training program, we want to really weave it in to existing uh, systems. So that that's the approach that we're taking. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot more um, accepted. And, and hopefully we can really create spaces to, you know, create those brave spaces, if you will, to to allow conversations to organically come about. Very cool. What, what organization is that, Diane? Yeah, I'm with Loretto Management Corporation. We're a healthcare facility. It's a long-term care and assisted living. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a continuum of care up in the central New York region. Nice. I, I'd really encourage you to take a look at this book I was just talking about. If you go to- yeah, I actually have it at home. <laughs> Excellent. What uh, is the name of the book? It's, um, it's called- <laughs> Oh, gosh, I'm trying to see if I've got it. Hold on a second. I'm going to check here. Yeah. Change Champions. Is it the Inclusion Breakthrough? Okay. This one's called okay. Change Champions, a Dialogic Approach for Creating Inclusive Culture. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I've got some, I I've got, uh, I've got a couple of program, a uh, couple of books from Miller and Katz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one, see what this one does, it's not in any of their other books. It really lets you in under the hood. To the secret oh, nice. sauce of what they do and okay. how they go about doing it and what i like also about this book is that even though it focuses on like all the examples around creating inclusive cultures the change champion strategy will work for any culture change where you're really trying to shift the narrative and the sort of underlying belief system in this in the organization uh, around it could be around safety you know it could even be around profitability i mean it, you know whatever it is um, and it's, uh, I learned a lot working on that book with them. It was a very interesting book. I can't wait to get that book. No, thank you. Yeah. All our books are great. <laughs> they really are. I, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time editing them and making sure, um, that, uh, they're going to be practical, readable, you know, provide. And what's the name of the series again? The BMI series and Dialogic OD, and okay. we, we self-publish it through Amazon. So it's uh, okay. one of those, uh, if you go to Amazon and put in BMI series and Dialogic OD, they're all there. But if you go to our website, which is the Bush Marshak Institute for Dialogic OD, mm -hmm. uh, they're all there, as well as dozens and dozens of papers and articles and videos and all for download. It's all, uh, we're really trying to, we, we developed the site a couple of years ago to support practice. Like up until 2020, most of our work had been more academic and trying to build a theory base behind it. But uh, the, uh, the um, we're trying now because people, you know, write me and say, where can I learn how to do this stuff? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's uh, no, so we needed to support that. So um, we just have a little bit of time left. If anybody has a burning question, to ask, or you can put it in the chat. Can I, really... I just want to, I want to address, um, you know, something that was said earlier about remote hybrid and how, how difficult it is to, to build trust. Um, yeah, I lived and worked in the uh, remote hybrid world for almost 12 years, and I'm actually still working hybrid in my current role. And um, I, I will say that um, you know, the in-person component is important. At the same time, I went through a leadership, an executive leadership program that was 100% online and it spanned about five months. And the relationships that I was able to build despite the, the, the online mm -hmm. um, platform I, I just I, I I love going back and and just staying connected with those people because we had we we shared I think part of it is is that what you share and and what what's being developed through a program, um, but you know the 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 vulnerability and the the, the honesty and the, the the bravery the courage that people had in this program it was profound and it just I think it really established some amazing relationships. So I think that the trouble is, is that I think in, in our, at least in American work workplace, that that level of vulnerability is lacking and people fear that in a very, very big way. 
Wow. So I think that that gets in the way of building that trust. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so like vulnerability and trust that go hand in hand. And, 100%. Yeah. And so finding ways to do that online. I mean, we've been able to take the clear leadership course and do it online and it works mm -hmm. and, and it, it can be powerful, but, and I've been doing it online now for the last couple of years. And this was the first time I had a chance to do it in person. And I forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just the, the whole yeah, other level, right? The one to go to. It was just mm -hmm. a, a notch deeper, right? Yeah. 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 So, but um, well, I'm glad to hear you. You can do that. Would you like to write a book for us? <laughs> I've never thought about writing a book. Well, no, I have. I have. I have considered it. <laughs> we could talk later, Jim. <laughs> Is it okay if I just, I wanted to piggyback on what Diana was saying, because I too, when I was thinking about it, I became a manager and a leader in 2020, March 31st, 2020, to be exact. And so when you think about March 31st, 2020, which was right at COVID, and I inherited a team of 28 people, and that team was 100%. They went, and I work in healthcare, so they, people were in person, and I inherited them, they were totally online. Wow. And trying to build a team during that time was tremendously challenging, but I definitely, on the other side, can say it is possible, I think, as a leader yes. um, of understanding what's needed. I, you know, during that time, I also entered um, my doctorate program for OD. And so one of the books were um, Dr. Shine's book on humble leadership. And that was tremendous in understanding those levels of leadership and going deep within my with my team members of really taking time with them, even in a virtual space, even if it was one-on-one, -on -one, yes. um, to build that trust and build that, um, as you know, you put collaborative organization. So I needed to build my organization in a way that I had those elements, but I didn't have a choice because we had COVID. So it's amazing and remarkable what we can do when we don't get those choices, but still having a, a very strong um, motivation to make it work and to be the leader that you really have um, or want to be for your team. So I just wanted to add that. What were some of the things that, you, in your opinion, you feel really made it successful, the transition to online? I think, you know, relationships are just, no matter whether it's in person or, on, or online, relationships is the key. Yeah. And if you have a leader who's really, really, really driven and dedicated to make those relationships happen, even the ones who are reluctant <laughs> for yeah. those relationships. Um, I definitely feel it's, it's possible, but it, it does take a leader who has that mindset of how important and critical relationships are in on a team structure, as well as in a leadership relationship. I also think it speaks to purpose, right, Constance? Like when you, when you hear the term leader and you really lean into what does that mean for you as an individual, right? I feel like there's a, a, a distinct correlation between that and your purpose, right? It's not being a manager, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? It's how are you ensuring that you're you're pouring into these individuals in the context of or in the service of, you know, whatever that may be. So I think that, you know, I, I heard purpose earlier and I feel like there's a really um, distinct pull through for the entire conversation in terms of how do you utilize it? How do you apply it? What does it mean to you intrinsically and how you demonstrate it? Absolutely. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I think that what Constance has, has demonstrated is there is a very high level of commitment and intentionality. Um, you know, that that's that's what makes remote, remote and hybrid work is you've got to have a high level of intentionality and realize you just can't take what the operating model was in person and just plop it into a remote hybrid. It doesn't work. It, mm -hmm. You know, people are saying, oh, this is not a working model. Well, you have to work at it and you have to be committed to, to finding ways to create those connections. So absolutely. I feel like we're getting warmed up and it's just getting better and better and better. <laughs> um, so. Um, 
Oh, ISODC. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, if um, this is sponsored by the International Society for Organization Development and Change. If you are not a part of that organization, uh, please go to isodc.org and uh, see how you can uh, get plugged in with them. There's so many ways. And uh, it's just a great organization of people that want to make the world better. Uh, and so um, I just want to encourage you to do that. Jervis, thank you so much. I really loved, I just really loved this conversation. You know, we didn't do death by PowerPoint or anything like that. And uh, it was just, uh, I, I got so much out of it. I, I hope you guys did too. Yeah. Thanks everybody for showing up.